Christ Presbyterian Church. <laughs> Here you are. And uh, so good to see uh, many of you I know. And so good to see so many of you I do not know. And that's very exciting. I, I uh, feel so privileged that uh, Pastor Greg invited me to preach, although mostly he's been pestering me, the next time you're here, you have to preach, so <laughs> after today, you know, that, that uh, but it's a good here, good to be here, and uh, Eileen, good to meet you and hear great things uh, about you, and good to take a peek into your office, and it, it looks appropriately like an ordained youth pastor's <laughs> office, you know, parabats and also parachute stuff or whatever, you know, so, and uh, I was just talking with uh, uh, Eileen, too. I said, gosh, Pastor Greg, he looks like he'd be fun to work with. I'd like to work with that guy. <laughs> so, so fun. Are you buying lunch this Tuesday or am I? Yeah, okay, here we go. You're even more fun now. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so pleased to be here. And i uh, been gone about four and a half years. and came back when... I mean, I originally started here in 92, and so I was here quite a bit. Many good memories, and, uh, and so good to be here. Well, um, our uh, scripture reading today is from uh, the book of Ephesians. And uh, so, uh, Mia, maybe I think we pull that up. Uh, Ephesians 3, and, excuse, excuse me, Ephesians 1, beginning at the third verse. Is that what I said to Amy this week? Yeah, good, okay. <laughs> and... Uh, Let's, uh, let's pray before we hear the scriptures. Almighty God, we thank you for good gifts. Uh, uh, open our ears as your scriptures are read and your word is preached that by the power of your Holy Spirit we might hear what you want to say to us today. In the hope and power of our Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hear then the word of the Lord. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us and the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to the good pleasure that he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time, to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him, who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we who were the first to set our hope on Christ might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with a seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people to the praise of his glory. Uh, here ends our reading, the word of the Lord. Thanks, well, I, I wanted today to talk about uh, reconciliation. And, of course, Ephesians is the, the book in the New Testament. Paul is, is uh, big time into reconciliation uh, in this book. And we love it when uh, parties are reconciled and when we get a chance to see this. I was talking with my brother-in-law, <coughs> Alvaro on the phone in, in April, and I called him. It was the uh, first anniversary of uh, uh, the day of the death of his wife, my sister, my sister Diana. And so I wanted to talk to him. We had a fantastic, longest conversation I've had with um, ever on the phone. And just great, sharing stories that I remember. And, uh, and he also shared with me Something that I had not known, and a conversation that had happened between my sister Diana and my, my mom just a couple years before my mom uh, died. I didn't ask my sister or my mom permission to share just about them. I could share all of it. Uh, they're both dead, so I'll suffer them. <laughs> you know, the uh, uh, consequences later. Um, but, um, 
but but Alvaro, uh, he was showing me, uh, and not to go into a lot of details, but but something had happened in my sister's young adulthood where my um, my mom was less than kind in a time of vulnerability. I didn't realize um, much of the the, the 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 bigness of this issue until I was late in my forties, but it had happened many many years earlier. But that, anyway, my sister had talked to my mom about that and how hurtful that was. And my mom had, there was a kind of a rapprochement, a reconciliation that happened uh, right at the nursing home where my mom uh, was living right on El Camino Real. And I was just so glad to hear this, you know, seven years after my mom had died and a year after my sister had died. And uh, we, we like it when people have reconciliation moments and, and it's, we're so great. And, and, and Paul is big into reconciliation, but for him it has a particular focus. And that focus is on Jesus Christ. And I don't know how many times you noticed in the scripture passage, he's talking about unity, and um, how much he uses the phrase in him, or in Christ, or in the beloved. I'll just uh, fly through some of this. Uh, he says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children, according to his good pleasure and his will, to the praise of his glorious grace. In him, says it again, Paul, he, he was repetitive. You thought this was a long text, you should read it in Greek. In him we have redemption. What's redemption? That's a, recre that's a return to a created order. Um, we have redemption through his blood and forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us and so on. So about nine times the phrase in him or in the beloved or in Christ happened. Also, the, the word us, we, or our um, happens like 13 times. So there's a lot going on in this passage about Christ and about us. And I think the key thing is we pay attention to what that is. And are we living it in our own lives? There's two particular things I want to talk about about um, what, what has happened in Christ. And the first is this, that um, we are chosen in Christ. I mean, I'm wondering if you could pull up, you know, the beginning of the scripture text. Can you do that? There you are. Okay. Keep going back. Yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't give you a warning on this. That's good. That's good. Okay. Go to the next slide. This is right in verse 4. Uh, just as he chose us in Christ, this is a good, before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him uh, in love. He destined us for adoption through his as his children through Jesus Christ. Keep going. For more. According to the will of his, the pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in love. But there's a sense of being chosen, adoption. Is there any other greater gift than adoption for the birth mother to choose to give this child a better life? And she thinks she can give. And for parents to be waiting so long, there's something about being chosen that is really incredible. I remember when I was playing basketball at Oceanside High School. You know, I went body surfing yesterday, and the old body just doesn't do what it used to do. So I'm, I'm not playing basketball anymore, you know. I probably should not be body surfing anymore. Um, but back then, I remember it was my sophomore year, and Coach Christopher was, uh, he had this ritual, it was a Wednesday practice, and at every practice he would throw out five red mesh jerseys. And uh, we'd finished our warm-ups and we'd be shooting free throws, and then he would just go around and he'd throw the red mesh jersey to five players. And this was a marking, this was a ritual, and that meant if you got a jersey, it meant you were starting at the next game. And uh, this one particular practice, he threw me a red jersey. I had never started that year. And we were 10 games into the season. And boy, that, that was something. You know. Of course, being chosen, there's something a little, uh, sometimes there's a negative with that. And that meant my friend Charlie, he didn't have a red jersey. And he had started the first, the first uh, uh, 10 games. And uh, there is something about high school that's all about getting chosen and unchosen. And this was even before Facebook and all that. <laughs> And uh, you could get unfriended very easily, even before we had that term. Sometimes even in the Reformed tradition, we've kind of goofed up this, this idea of being chosen and being elected. And 
we've ended up with some very weird doctrines. Um, and I never really studied all that much. I don't think John Calvin originated them, but, but we had this calcification that happened somewhere over the last 500 years. And some of you may remember there was a, things like predestination, double predestination. I don't, I don't even, did you ever study that stuff? You did, okay, I hope it for they did a better job. I just don't remember getting much of a handle on that at PTS, I don't know about you. And um, um, I remember when I was a youth director at a church in Spokane, Washington, just walking on the street and this guy found out I was a youth director at a Presbyterian church. He said, oh, double pre predestination. <laughs> nothing, you know, but, 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 but what we did is we took a great doctrine, which was about a very inclusive doctrine of being chosen, and then sometimes it got um, in all the details and kind of legalese and kind of a rigidification, we became more concerned sometimes with who's not chosen, and I think that's a big mistake. Well, one of the reasons I love the book of Ephesians is the most uh, detailed comment that, that Paul makes about election. It's a very inclusive doctrine. Because what he's trying to argue there, and he's really big in this in chapter 2, is he's trying to make Gentiles who are outside the covenant of the family of God, make sure they know that in Christ they are no longer strangers. Those who once were far off, Paul says in chapter 2, have been brought near in Christ. And I could go on talking about what it means to be chosen in Christ, how we're chosen not for privilege but for service. How we're chosen for freedom, not for slavery. But there's another thing I want to say about being chosen. And uh, that's this. That not only are we chosen in Christ, but we are chosen in Christ together with people we would not choose. Now, this is what makes church so interesting and so fun. And, uh, and, uh, uh, Mia, keep going on the slides a little bit further to verses 8 and 9. Keep going. Flip it a little more. Okay, wait, wait. No, no. Back up a little bit. Sorry. Yeah. We'll back up a little more. Okay, yeah. Stop right there. Okay, here we go. Okay. Now that, uh, this is verse 9. Uh, with all wisdom and insight. Okay, this is very good. Okay. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will. You can hold it. Okay, mystery. Mystery. I just want to say mystery of his will. Paul, whenever he talks about mystery, does here in Rome, it, in Ephesians and here in Romans, he always is talking about one thing. Okay. And now he's going to get to it and say what it is. And then in chapter 3 he'll talk about it more. So mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, they set forth in Christ. We kind of lead right up to it. And here's the mystery. Mystery is as a plan for the fullness of time. Well, actually, that's not the mystery. It's a plan for the fullness of time. Here it is. To gather up all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. So mystery. Remember, Paul is a Pharisee Jew. He never quits being a Pharisee. He always went to the synagogue. He's a kosher Jew. But the mystery and the great surprise to him, because it was a surprise to the early church, which is all Jewish, all kosher, you know, up until the Holy Spirit started messing around and bringing those darn pagans like us in, the Gentiles. And then Paul, he saw, and God gave him this gift. This is the mystery that in Christ those outsiders are brought in. This is the plan for the fullness of time. That in Christ all things, it's not just people, but all the created order is brought together in Christ. It's a remarkable thing. But what that means is I don't get to choose who comes to the baptismal form. That I'm brought together with other people that I would probably not choose myself. I remember a moment in that kitchen. My gosh, it must have been the Neolithic era. I don't know, but I, there were two people. And I don't know how many of you remember this. This one woman here, and uh, I don't think she's able to worship anymore here at all, but Erlene Bain, some of you may remember her. Now. And she was the master cook, and her sidekick, Velma Turley, who I buried <laughs> years ago. You remember Velma? Yeah, gosh, she went to 103, and, uh, but she wasn't that old then, but she was back there, and they were cooking a meal or something. And I came back, and I was talking about someone who had started worshiping with our church. I enjoyed her very much. Very quirky, interesting person who had lived in their neighborhood. I said, how exciting it is. I'll call her Susie. Susie, see her church. And they're like, 
And I, just, I just, you know, and Erlene was welcoming of everybody. They just, they just were paused and was like, well, you know, they were just like, and, um, and I got that. It was kind of true. But before Erlene came out the door, I remember she goes, but she had some of that avocado salad. She had, she always was pretty rigid about not dressing it until the last minute. So you know, maybe that's why I was back there. So anyway, and she's bringing it. She goes, but hey, this church has welcomed me. And I'm a piece of work. <laughs> and, and, and it was just this wonderful, just this, this, and that's just who she was. And CPC, it's who you are. And, and I just, it, you taught me so much in that, and that we're chosen together. And yeah, it, that's, that's part of who it is. And, and the people we, we wouldn't necessarily choose. Um, um, I was at a um, at a conference. So I was on conference, a workshop at uh, Seattle Pacific University, and uh, this New Testament professor was doing a presentation, and he he had been talking about um, how this uh, idea that the wrong kinds of people get in the Bible story it happens in all kinds of places, and he had been talking about um, uh, the story of the Magi in Matthew's Gospel. You know, Matthew's the only one that talks about the three wise guys. We don't even know if there were three, but there were three gifts. And what's interesting about that passage, I've always known this, is that uh, magi are, we're pretty sure we're uh, astrologers. Maybe Zoroastrian astrologers. And you need to know, in the Old Testament, astrologers get the worst press. They are condemned more than any other uh, kind of people. Okay? And yet, at the beginning of Matthew's Gospel, they are the first ones to worship Jesus. The wrong people. They're strong. Well, this professor was bringing out something that I, I had forgotten and wasn't paying attention so much. That Matthew's gospel is a gospel that's particularly written for a Jewish audience. So that's even funnier. Because you could just imagine these, these Christians who are all Jewish kind of paying attention to this. Oh, yes. You're oh, you have this in your story, you know. We didn't, you know, Luke doesn't have, but here's the magic. What are they doing in our story? They don't belong there. <laughs> but they belong there. And this is what Matthew's trying to bring out, and this is why Paul writes the way he does, because Jesus Christ is at the very center. And that's, that's what, that's what makes it work. This professor went on to say something I think is very important, helpful for me. And he start, started talking about um, how communities often organize themselves either of two ways. One, as a bounded set, these are sociological terms, bounded set or a centered set. And he was going on about this. I read a little bit about this, but he, he, when he was explaining it, it made sense to me. And uh, let me just, just, some of you may be familiar with these terms, but let me just throw them out. So a bounded set is a group of people, these are using anthropological circles, sort of this is a group of people that's defined by the boundary. Okay? And there's a boundary that's determined, and it sets who it decides who's outside that the group and who's inside. When I got a red mesh jersey and four other guys in, that's a bounded set. Okay. That meant when we were playing fallback, whoever we were going to lose to at the next game, we lost one. Uh, you know, at the, at, the, at the opening tip off, there were only going to be five folks on the floor for our team, and the rest would be on the bench. That's a bounded set. Do you know how much of our culture is organized by a bounded set? And you have a boundary. I mean, it, it, a hum, humanity is really good at this, and we're getting better at it all the time. A boundary that says, you don't belong in here. Sometimes churches organize themselves that way. And it happens. We are with people we like. No Presbyterian church is ever like that. I know. <laughs> but this professor went on and said, but the church isn't a bounded set. It really is a centered set. And the centered set is not defined by the boundary, which sets the line of who's outside and who's inside. A center set is defined by the center. And all that determines whether or not you're in the group is are you in relationship with the center. It's not about who's in and who's out, but who's at the center. 
And this is why Paul is adamant about this. Anytime the center of the church is threatened, he just goes ballistic. I mean, read Galatians. That guy is mad. He's ticked off. Because some people are saying, no, you have to be a kosher Jew. There's a boundary here to be in the church. And Paul says, no, that can't be the case. And he's always, that's why he's so, he's such a fighter. At the center. And this is why the story of the prodigal son, the son goes away. As soon as you turn around, you're in the set. Doesn't matter how far we go from God, we turn around, we're in relationship with the very center. And I think it's key for our world that there's going to be unity, there's going to be reconciliation in all kinds of circles. That the church be a model that kind of centered set, where Jesus Christ, you know, is the center. You know, a month ago, last weekend, Representative Scalise was uh, shot at that practice in Virginia, Washington, D.C. suburb before the, the Republican and Democratic baseball game. I didn't even know those guys played baseball. <laughs> they probably don't. <laughs> when I heard that someone shot a representative at a baseball practice, trying to show some kind of ability to work together. I was ticked. I said, they better not cancel that game. And they didn't. And who was it? I can't remember. Was it ESPN or somebody? Uh, showed the game. I didn't watch it. Who wants to watch that? But I did watch the end. <laughs> and they were, you know, but they were shaking hands. And we had three days where Republicans and, and Democrats were working together on the Hill a little bit. And, and uh, you know, with, Praise God for that little blip of the <laughs> moment, and uh, we hope for more of that. But that was great. And I think if we're going to have more of that kind of stuff, the church at least needs to be, uh, know where its unity is. So we're chosen in Christ, and we're chosen together with people we wouldn't choose. And at the very center of it, is this our Savior, our Lord, Jesus? Well, let's pray. God, grace, we, we thank you for... Uh, for the Apostle Paul and, and uh, your scriptures, and uh, thank you for uh, church and the quirkiness of who we are, you being the center and not me, not us, and that you've chosen us for your kingdom. Help us as we bear witness to your love and all its manifestations. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.